We are now live, everyone. Welcome, everyone, to this new live show uh, that I'm calling the Viking News Show. It's a this is the premiere of a new live stream where we'll be talking about all the daily news uh, from around the world, especially from Europe and Sweden. And also have a special guest, uh, Stephen Franson, with me. We will do he will be doing a segment on American news uh, later on in the show. Thank you so much for joining me, Stephen. Thanks for having me, Peter. It's great that you're doing a new show. I look forward to what we can do. Excellent. Now, thank you so much for for being here. And he's got plenty of good stuff to 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 give us about all the stuff happening in America later with the Kavanaugh, uh, the White House draft on big tech companies and and things like that. So, make sure to stay tuned for that. And we we'll also be going our first. We'll be going over all the news from uh, Europe and Sweden. I have a quite an interesting. Uh, interesting list of stuff to talk about today we have quite a lot of madness going on uh, especially with the election in sweden which uh, i will be focusing uh, focusing on a lot so so um before we just get into it i just want to say this will be a i'm, I'm trying to get this to be like a, a big live stream show kind of like worski live or something like that uh to you know, get, give you the daily news. You know, the mainstream media, they have you the usual six o'clock news at night, you know, BBC, CNN. I want this to be a uh, rival to that, bringing you the, the most important news topics from around the world. So thank you so much for tuning in. This will be a daily show, uh, or I'll just start with around maybe three, three times a week, but we'll, we'll try to do this daily later on. And I'll give you all the times and so on later on before we finish. So let's uh, get right into the news. I'm sure you all are... Uh, excited or interested to hear what's happening with the election in Sweden. So um, there has been a lot of reports of election fraud in Sweden. You know, the election in Sweden were just a couple of weeks ago. And uh, it was a bit strange because the Swedish Democrats, uh, which is the nationalist anti-migrant party, uh, they are really the only ones you can vote for if you if you want to if you want to change Sweden around for the better, in my opinion. Uh, they're polling constantly at 25, 30 percent uh, in first place. Even the latest YouGov poll just before the election had them at around 25 percent at first place. And YouGov, they have actually been the most accurate in the in the last election in Sweden. So you can kind of think that they would have things more or less right. But it turned out that they only got 18 percent, uh, roughly a little bit under 18, in third place, with the socialists. The Socialist Party uh, winning at around 28%. Uh, but in the polls, they only got around 22, 23%, but they got 28. Meanwhile, the Swedish Democrats got a lot less than expected. You know, that really is a little bit suspicious right there. What, what, do you th what are your thoughts on that, Stephen? Well, what stood out to me about um, these claims of voter fraud is that you'll look at the polling stations in other Scandinavian countries like Norway, and they've got a curtain over it. They've got a, a place where you can sort of do it in private. But maybe this is not the case everywhere in Sweden, but I'm seeing pictures of tables uh, with the ballots just laid out there. And it seems that people can just walk up and grab and uh, change the votes however they see fit. I was totally astonished to see this. So it's also worth noting that with the Social Democrats, uh, a lot of the votes that they're pulling in apparently are from foreigners. Uh, and, and this is suspect to a lot of manipulation because of the amount of Swedish no-go zones that there are. Uh, and so there's so much lawlessness and criminality that's happening in these places. And then the Social Democrats are doing a bunch of spending in order to drive the votes in these places because lo and behold, people come to Sweden and they don't want the rest of the world coming. So they do pull in votes that way, uh, but they do it in these places are very suspect. So it seems to me that there's a lot of credibility to these claims of over 900 uh, cases of you know voting fraud. Yeah, and it, I think uh, especially I want to um, uh, go a little bit more into what you said there regarding the, the Social Democrats importing voters. It was actually, I don't know if you saw it, uh, but you reminded me. I'll just bring it up on screen here as well so people can see. Um, here is the results from the, from the no-go zone uh, Rinkeby, which has about a 90% Muslim population, uh, migrant population. Uh, and m many of them are Muslims from Muslim countries. Um, in this area, the Socialist Democrats here, as you can see, they got 77% of the votes. <laughs> then you have the Communist Party down here at 12%. And 
And then we have, uh, I don't know, the, I cannot read, uh, the Green Party, 3%, um, the Swedish Democrats at 3%, uh, and like barely anything else for other parties here. So it kind of, um, it kind of seems like the policy of mass migration uh, kind of paid, paid off here in this area. <laughs> it's, uh, it, it's really insane when you think about it. This is a 90% migrant area, you know, there are reports that Sweden will take in another 300,000 asylum seekers the next three years. And in about 40 to 50 years, Swedes will actually be a minority in their own country. So it will, will be minority migrant. You know, that's kind of a guaranteed uh, success that the Socialist Democrats will then stay in power forever. I mean, I mean, really, it's, that's, you cannot make another, any other conclusion. What do, you, or what, what do you think? Isn't it a bit similar to what you have in America? Well, I think it is, um, particularly in America, we have this situation where there are a lot of uh, Latinos, a lot of people coming from over the southern border, and they tend to want a hard left policies. They uh, are totally against free speech by and large. They're against gun rights. They don't seem to understand property rights very well by the way they treat our national parks and our public spaces. And so there's this huge contingent of people that is now amassing in the United States that really want socialist policies. They uh, want to be taken care of by the government. And so, and, and they also seem to have a bit of a nationalistic streak. And so which way it'll go, um, whether we'll have a sort of national socialism in, in America or whether we'll have some sort of banana republic is, is yet to be seen, but it's pretty ripe for a strong person to just take over. And I could see uh, someone coming from the Latino contingent uh, making appeals in that direction. So it's very interesting. You bring in all these people and then they bring their politics with them. They bring their culture with them. I mean, we're seeing reports in Sweden of 50% of Muslims wanting to just outright ban homosexuality in the country. So, you know, I wouldn't be surprised if Sweden takes a hard right turn, and I wouldn't be surprised if America takes a hard left turn. Uh, but eventually, we know with totalitarianism that they both sort of meet up, you know, the hard left and the hard right, they always resort to authoritarianism and totalitarianism. So if, if Sweden goes that way, I just really wouldn't be surprised. It's actually funny that you mention that because uh, I don't know if you saw this, but there was actually a story here in, in Sweden about the election. A, a woman that was campaigning for the Green Party, she's actually an MP in the parliament for the Green Party. Uh, I have a li little screenshot here of her campaign poster that she posted on her Facebook. This is in Somalian. Um, the first sentence here is uh, basically Allah Akbar uh, in Somalian. And she's writing that you should vote for a Somalian, Somalian person for the Swedish parliament. Uh, kind of a, like almost like an ethno-nationalist uh, message in, in a sense uh, that she posted. Um, there's also actually been uh, reports, um, actually quite interesting. It was in the news here a couple of days ago in Sweden, uh, a socialist MP, uh, she's in parliament. She was actually caught on TV breaking the law. She had actually gone to Turkey to campaign for well, I guess Swedish citizens living in Turkey, wanting them to vote for the Socialist Party. She's actually she's ethnically from Turkey herself, I believe. Um, and she was there. She was actually breaking the Swedish voting laws. She was in the uh, together where the people were, were, you know, okay, you know, writing which party they wanted to vote for. She was in the in the polling place uh, herself, making sure that they were voting for the right people, <laughs> the, the right party. And uh, she's actually also been campaigning with, um, uh, she's actually been seen campaigning with other people, with the pe representatives from uh, the fascist organization Grey Wolves, if you've heard of them. Uh, she's the socialist, uh, socialist democrat, uh, and, and they were the ones that won the election in Sweden here with 28%. So, uh, so, so that's quite interesting. And you mentioned earlier as well about people, um, people not voting, um, about the votes being public, that they aren't anonymous. Uh, I just want to clarify on that, how that works in Sweden. Um, the way it works in Sweden is that when you come into the polling station, uh, you have a table laid out with all of, uh, with a bunch of, um, uh, what do you say in English, uh, voting cards for the different parties. And you pick one uh, that you want to vote for. And everyone can see which party you pick. But the thing is, you're supposed to pick one from each party. Uh, so you have like a bunch of, of cards with you when you go in. So it, it could be anonymous that way. So it's... It's not as bad as some people think, in my opinion, but uh, 
um, a Danish uh, election observer from OCSC, I think it's called, um, International Election Observer, uh, did actually complain about this practice that uh, it was uh, was problems with anonymity. Uh, anonymity uh, of the elections in Sweden and he actually said it was the worst standards that he had seen in the whole of Europe. Well a lot of I mean the problem with those standards too is that people will inevitably because of just this this way of culture and this way of modernity it would seem put a kind of pressure socially on their loved ones to go with the establishment, to go with what is comfortable, to go with what has been, um, you know, uh, sort of institutionalized. We see that a lot in America where families are torn apart. I mean, the media will use families now politically. We just had a guy in Arizona named David Brill running an ad against his opponent, and the ad consisted of six siblings of this guy, this guy running against him. And all these people were saying, you know, brothers, sisters, they're all saying, we wouldn't vote for this guy. This guy is terrible. You know, he has bad policies, irresponsible, you know, and sort of doing this thing. So we're really seeing it now uh, commercialized almost the way that they're the liberals and the media are just destroying families. And so when you have low voting standards, and you have a situation where there's there's not a lot of anonymity, there's problems with that. Inevitably, you are going to see a lot of bigotry come in. You're gonna see a lot of reinforcement of the establishment. And so, you know, as far as the discrepancy between um, the polling numbers and the actual voting numbers, I think some of that could be due to problems with the voting system itself. And then I think, I think a lot of it has to do with fraud. So I think you're very right to be reporting on this, Peter. Yeah, and it's actually been out tonight, uh, quite a lot of news actually, some breaking news tonight that came out regarding this election fraud. Uh, so in total now we have 900 reports of election fraud, uh, most of them regarding the Swedish Democrats not getting the kind of votes that they would expect and so on. Um, and according to uh, Cecilia Persson at the election overseeing committee in Sweden, um, or the official election uh, election uh, institution, shall we say, uh, she, she says that this is uh, exceptionally many reports uh, that have came, come in this year. And that's true. I mean, last election, it was only maybe 100, 200 reports uh, of uh, fraud that came in. Now it's 900. Um, uh, but what's more interesting tonight, it actually came out, it was revealed that um, uh, that they have found a lot of faults in the vote count. Uh, in, especially in Stockholm, several people have actually been relieved from the job uh, counting the votes. Uh, so in other words, they have found uh, many cases where they actually counted the votes wrongly. So they might have voted for the Swedish Democrats, but say, ah, no, let's just ignore that. Let's just put them on for the Social Democrats, some, something like that in, 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 in that kind of way. Um, and there's also reports that many, many votes are actually, actually yet to be counted or presented in, in some districts because of Computer failure. <laughs> hmm. Starting to get a bit suspicious here. Um, and there's also um, there's also been many Swedes complaining on social media about election fraud. Uh, I have an example here. Uh, let, me, let me see if I can bring it up on screen for you. It's in Swedish, so you might not understand. Uh, but uh, I bring it up anyway. Uh, it's a screenshot from Facebook. Uh, he writes that uh, he was actually witnessing uh, the vote count in uh, in his in his uh, in his district, uh, and he got this all on tape and video uh, how the counters were actually uh, actually cheating. Uh, there were votes that were supposed to be blanks, but they just counted them towards the Socialist Democrats anyway. And there were other um, votes for the Swedish Democrats, the Nationalist Party. Um, he says that at first the vote count there was 189 votes for the Swedish Democrats, but all of a sudden they just changed it to 82 votes instead. Um, and he's all got this on recording and so on. And there's a lot of reports like this. So, I mean, it could very well be that there's some... Well, in my opinion, this is starting to get very suspicious. I mean, there's so many reports of election fraud. It, it cannot be ignored anymore. Right. Well, and it is the media's responsibility to be reporting on this. And I did some cursory research into this. And of course, Google is basically useless at this point. I mean, I can't tell you how many combinations of search terms I put in to try and find out about Swedish election fraud. 
eventually I got onto a fellow, um, you know, angry foreigner who I believe is, is a Slavic guy living in, in Sweden or something like this. And, and he was talking about it. And this was my main source for a lot of uh, what I've been talking about with you uh, in terms of my contribution. So when you have a media establishment in Sweden that is protecting uh, the the political elite and is um, sort of disregarding these problems. I mean, it's a situation of dire corruption. You know, it, I, I just can't believe what is going under the radar in Sweden in terms of these grenade attacks, in terms of selection fraud, the abuse of young children. So I think it's absolutely wonderful that you are reporting on this, Peter, and people need to know. People need to know what is happening in Sweden because Sweden is a kind of flagship for this multicultural experiment. And all of the evidence will bear out in Sweden as to whether multiculturalism is failing or is succeeding. Yeah, it's uh, definitely Sweden is one of the kind of forefronts of this uh, experiments for sure. And um, kind of the, the media in Sweden have reported a little bit about this, but they kind of just try and brush the carpet say, no, it's not, it's not really a problem. It's just, it's fine, it's fine, it's fine. Uh, that's a kind of uh, message that we've been getting from the media in Sweden. Okay, there are some reports, but yeah, it's probably fine. There's nothing to worry about. Um, on the other hand, the English media or international media haven't talked about this, this at all, so people outside of Sweden don't have a clue what's going on. Uh, so that's that, that's why I want to talk about this, and uh, it's, it's important that the message gets out. And um, I just want to go, by the way, to the chat quickly. We have a, a super chat here from uh, uh, Sean. He says, way to go, Peter. Wish you lots of success with your new show. I heard CNN is interested in having you on a panel. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm not sure they would, but <laughs> thank you so much for the super chat. And uh, and I just want to, um, all super chats will be will be read live on there. Uh, it's uh, it's excellent if you want to support this support this show and help it keeps going. It's uh, it's highly appreciated. And all super chats will be will be read live on there. And thank you so much, Sean, for that uh, that super chat and the comment. And yeah, I mean, if CNN is interested in having me on the on the panel, I would be. Very happy to do so, but <laughs> I have a feeling it, it might not happen. What do you think, Steve? <laughs> I don't know. I don't think they'd bring you on, but um, you know, I noticed when we both have a, a piano in the background. I notice you have a piano in the background, and I do. So, you know, I'm not sure what um, what value CNN play, places on young, intelligent, nationalistic men with pianos. But you know, if there's a place for it, then it, it you know, hopefully CNN finds it in their hearts to have us on. So. You do well. You do well on CNN. We we can we'll wait and see what happens. <laughs> Great. And um, going on, I, th I want to change topic a little bit, if you don't mind, uh, to our next uh, story here today. Um, a Swedish guy who did a citizen arrest on a thief is now facing charges of kidnapping. Yeah, this is not a joke. Um, so he caught the thieves, the thieves were stealing diesel uh, from his workplace. Um, let me just see if I can bring it up on screen so you can get a little more visual representation here. Here we go. Uh, just one second. Here we have, yeah, a Swedish man apprehended and turned a thief over to the police charged with kidnapping. Uh, Niklas Kramer, he spotted a thief on the surveillance camera and they managed to catch him. Uh, they were stealing diesel several times a week. They got them on a the CCTV camera and they had enough. So they went and did a citizen's arrest on the guy and uh, and uh, they tied ropes around his arms uh, to stop him from attacking them. And they called the police and the police um, the police came and arrested the guy. And here is the thief uh, caught on the CCTV camera. Um, so what do you think happens? Will he be... I mean, sh sh shouldn't the thief be kind of charged and uh, they should go off the thief and congratulate these people on arresting a thief? No, they actually go after the guy who arrested the thief uh, and they are prosecuting him for, quote, unlawful detention. And the reason for this, they say, is because uh, they didn't actually catch him in the act. They actually caught him the next day when they saw him around. So they saw him around and they recognized him and they did a citizen's arrest and that's unlawful detention kidnapping cannot have that going on. So they are now prosecuting the guy for, <laughs> for arresting the thief. <laughs> I mean, this, this can only come from bonkers countries like Sweden and maybe the UK. <laughs> I mean, uh, what would happen in America if this happened? I mean, you're from America. What would happen if something like this happened in America? 
Well, I think you'd find a good, uh, I mean, I think you'd find a lot of support in the, the justice system for these sorts of things. Um, there does seem to be in the United States some sense of justice. Um, it seems like the, the response to anything that is criminal or even aggressive in nature um, is really tamped down on by the uh, Swedish authorities. You know, like, oh, you were aggressive, you were an angry young man, or, you, oh, you were doing something that is uh, not uh, socially cohesive, or you're doing something to rock the boat. Well, we've got to bring charges against you. I mean, it's, it's ridiculous. This guy that was stealing the diesel left the country. He left the country, and then all investigation of him was dropped. But because, because the people that did something that was just and sane and moral in this world stuck around and they stayed within the jurisdiction, they're getting nailed by the Swedes, uh, by the Swedish government. So, you know, definitely in the United States, there is um, some rationality left in our justice system. I mean, I mean there's huge systemic problems, uh, particular, particularly with um, the uh, child protection services. We have a lot of problems with that in the United States. But, you know, a guy that was caught stealing diesel and then the next day a citizen's arrest performed on it, I mean, that's pretty heroic for the people that did that. But apparently in Sweden, it gets you it gets you all sorts of criminal charges. Yeah, we cannot we cannot have that going on. You know, you have to allow the criminals to roam free. Um, and, you know, considering he left the country, I mean, you can only speculate if he if he was from Sweden or perhaps uh, from another country as well. I mean. Probably a Swedish person would probably stay in the country. Who knows? But um, yeah, that's that, 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 that's an insane story. I mean, there's so many. Um, actually, uh, we have a, we have a, we actually have a similar story to this. Uh, quite a sad story. Um, so a little bit of warning if anyone is uh, is a little bit sensitive. But um, if you don't, if you remember the um, uh, 11-year-old girl uh, Ebba who was killed by a terrorist in Sweden last year. Uh, there's been some uh, some sad news about uh, about about her uh, recently here in Sweden. Uh, I'll just bring up a picture here uh, in case you don't remember who she was. But uh, she was uh, killed by the terrorists in Sweden last year. Uh, I believe five people were killed, and she was one of them. You might have seen some horrible pictures that were spread on social media after attack of uh, uh, of people torn in pieces. I'm definitely not going to share them here, but people were spreading them on social media after attack and uh, absolutely horrible. Uh, so she was 11 years old. She was actually deaf. So she was walking home from school uh, on the high street in Stockholm when this truck just came from behind and uh, smashed her to pieces and she didn't even know the truck was coming because she, because she was deaf. Absolutely sad story. And, uh, and, and what's happening now is even more sad. Um, so her grave has been vandalized several times by some some unknown person. Uh, but uh, here recently, her dad actually managed to catch the criminal in the act. Uh, so he kind of did a citizen's arrest. He caught the cr criminal in the act and he called the cops. And the cops came and, uh, and, and arrested him. But uh, then the cops, uh, the police set him free. And now her grave has been vandalized again. Can she not at least get this dignity i mean why are the police releasing someone like this i mean this is a this is a quite a serious crime in my opinion why are the police in sweden releasing releasing this guy and now he's free to do the same thing again i mean i don't know how how how, how would that go down in america it boggles the mind uh crime is just so out of control you know, here in the United States, we had a story come out of Long Island, uh, one of the boroughs of New York City, uh, in a little hamlet called Brentwood. Uh, a woman was preparing a vigil service for her daughter, I believe, who had been killed uh, by MS-13, uh, the, the main sort of scary Latino gang that we've got in the United States. They really are scary. And she was struck by an SUV a white SUV, um, and it looks like it was a hit put out on her by MS-13, a message for her to not be, um, you know, bringing people together and speaking out against MS-13. And the mother died. So her daughter was killed by MS-13. And then as she was preparing a vigil service, she was killed by MS-13. Uh, this lets you know a little bit about the state 
of crime in the United States, it is on the rise. Murders are on the rise, uh, violent crimes are on the rise, and of course we know that has a lot to do with social cohesion, has a lot to do with people's participation in civic society. We have a multicultural society that's developing here. Uh, there is not a lot of sort of recourse for the average person to rein in some of these criminal gangs that are operating in the country. And then of course under Obama, we had a really lax attitude toward organized crime. We had an especially lax attitude toward, uh, you know, criminal, criminal syndicates coming from out of the country into our lands and hurting our people, killing our people. So that's only changing with Donald Trump. Um, so that's kind of how it would go. it's going down in the United States. It's uh, like a situation of impunity. I mean, these, these gangsters, these criminal thugs, they, seem to have an extra edge these days because maybe maybe they figure their days are numbered so I, that's certainly my hope but you know something like what happened with this young girl in sweden i could see that i could see um the criminal element doing something like that and agitating the situation but i really couldn't see the the law enforcement side of things doing what the swedes have with that situation i think we do have a bit more sanity in our justice system, as I said earlier. Definitely, and that's the thing that irritates me the most with Sweden is the, uh, I can point it, I can just say, it. the problem in Sweden is not the migrants. The problem in Sweden is the Swedish people, the leftists, the liberals, who are allowing all this stuff to happen, having this insane justice system, just allowing criminals to do whatever they want without any, any consequences, uh, insane mass migration policies. The migrants are not the problem. The problem is the Swedish leftists and liberals, the, the white people. <laughs> I mean, that, that's, that's, the, that's the real root issue we have. Uh, all the people that are behind it, uh, the elites, uh, the, the, the Swedish people, the leftists and liberals, not the migrants themselves necessarily. So I think that's one thing that's important to keep in mind. And um, I think maybe we can uh, have another topic here as well uh, from, um, actually, maybe we should just do a little bit of a big switch here in the news topic. <laughs> uh, I just want to go, by the way, quickly to a super chat here from a guy who uh, calls himself audience member. Uh, thank you so much for super chat. Uh, he's from Norway, I believe. He's writing something in Norwegian. I have a little bit hard to understand. <laughs> I bet uh, English people won't have a clue. Uh, he says, uh, Ibsen's rips, busker, and books växt. Basically, he's talking about plants. Um, he's talking about different kinds of uh, plants and bushes. Um, interesting comment. I don't know what to say about that, but thank you so much for Super Chat anyway. All the Super Chats helps keep this show going and it's highly appreciated. And all Super Chats will be read live on our also, while you're here, remember to smash that like button as well. That will help get this video more views. Uh, thank you so much for everyone tuning in. Um, yeah, maybe do a little bit of a uh, big switch here on the news cycle, if you don't mind. Then maybe we can come over to the American segment a little bit after that, uh, Stephen, if you don't mind. Yeah. Um, there's some news from the good old United Kingdom. <laughs> Uh, the United Kingdom is actually probably as crazy, if not crazier, than Sweden now, I think. Um, so, um, uh, I don't know where to start with, where to start with this one. The, the, the British Army is introducing gender-neutral army training. This is not a joke. <laughs> it's actually happening. Um, I don't know what to say. I mean, I'm just going to bring it up on screen here, see if I can, yeah, so we can get a bit of a visual representation here. Just bear with me uh, one second. I'm doing all the studio stuff and, and everything at once. Um, here we go. I think you should have it on screen now. Um, the new gender neutral army training sees press ups and sit ups dropped in favor of new quote unquote achievable fitness test. The field army sergeant major Gavin Payton said a new test were launched because the enemy doesn't care about age or gender. <laughs> hey Peter, I just got to tell you your your, uh, your article's not showing up. It's just oh. a black screen for me. Okay, it's not showing. Hmm. Let me see if I can fix that. Looks like we're having technical difficulties. Thank you for uh, notifying me. Um, let me see if I can fix that. Apologies, guys, technical difficulties. Um, 
let's see if this sorts the issue out. It's it's pretty amazing to see they are dropping they're dropping press ups. I mean, this is this is a British uh, publication. I'm reading it from the Sun. They they're dropping press ups, which are, which are push ups, and then they're also dropping sit ups. Uh, in favor of new achievable fitness test uh, requirements. So they really are trying to, I think when I first saw this story, I was like, oh great, okay, oh that's a really clever way, gender neutral. Oh, maybe they will raise the standards and you know it'll be kind of like a, a, a nudge nudge, a wink wink in the right direction for men to be able to uh, you know, succeed and women to be more sort of, uh, cast out or kept out of active duty frontline sort of service, but no, it looks like they're dropping some of their requirements and making this harder on people. Just something I wanted to mention as you were sorting out the technical details. Can you hear me, Stephen? I can hear you. It looks like your uh, looks like your video dropped or something like that. Yes, it did. I think we had some uh, problems there. Everything just uh, freaked out. Yeah, hmm. I've never seen that before. Well, you, uh, you guys, let us know in the chat if we're back, uh, if we're solid again and connected with you. Uh, it'd be good to put these technical details behind us. Yeah, I think I think we are live now. But uh, we had some technical, I think the chat is saying here that they lost us momentarily, but I believe we are back, I hope. Uh, let us know if, uh, if everything is working now in the chat, uh, if you want. <laughs> we had some, uh, I don't know, we had some uh, NSA in our computers maybe, I don't know. Maybe <laughs> they didn't like the news report. <laughs> I don't know what happened there. But uh, I think we are good now. Uh, all right, yeah, let's get back to the topic in uh, question. Uh, we were talking about the, um, uh, the gender neutral army training thing. Um, let me see if I can manage to bring that back up on screen. No, okay, I'm just gonna ignore that for the moment. Um, but uh, yeah, so we had a gender neutral army thing going on in the UK and uh, just so amazing. The, the, the field army sergeant major, major says that the, the new assignments will be rolled out next year uh, because the enemy, quote, doesn't care about gender or age, unquote. So the enemy apparently doesn't care about, and about gender and age. Okay, well, um, uh, that's interesting. They say that the, the new systems, uh, the soldiers will have to do a four kilometer march carrying 40 kilos of equipment in less than 40 minutes, followed by a two kilometer march carrying 25 kilos of equipment in under 15 minutes. Soldiers should then have to complete a fire and move exercise in less than five minutes, followed by a 20 meter drag of 110 kilo weight. Uh, and they say that, uh, that the enemy doesn't care about uh, your gender and so on. I think my thoughts are, um, well, yeah, of course the enemy doesn't care. Well, I, I think they do care actually, because if the enemy comes at you, at you with like uh, an army of huge muscular men, and you have an army of small women, I, I think it's going to be a problem. <laughs> That's a significant problem. And, uh, you know, it's worth noting with these tests, I mean, uh, the Sun is saying, they're saying, for 20 years, fitness assessments were focused on aerobic fitness, demanding stamina, muscular endurance, and strength. Now you have to just carry a few things. You've got to carry a few things, and then you're done. Well, any woman that is used to carrying a heavy load of groceries, you know, the average woman that can carry, you know, some heavy, oh, maybe she's got a brisket in there and, and maybe a gallon jug of milk or something like this. She's carrying heavy groceries and maybe she's got a bit of, you know, sort of excitement going, some adrenaline going because drill instructors are yelling at her in the moment. Well, she can pass this test. And that, the grocery test, I think, should be the new standard. I mean, groceries are gender neutral. Men and women go for groceries. So let's just do a grocery test. Let's do away with this political correctness of this new system they just instituted. And let's go 
all the way, Peter. What do you think? Well, it's uh, it's uh, I, I don't really know what to say. <laughs> it's uh, I'm too I'm too confounded about this whole situation. I I can't understand that these uh, British people are allowing. You know, they had the best arm, one of the best armies in the world, and they're allowing all this to happen. I mean, these were the guys that fought that beat the Nazis. Uh, together with America and now they are just I don't know I don't know <laughs> I, can, I can imagine Russia and China just laughing just laughing at them uh, you know I think they're very I think they're very happy about this <laughs> very happy um, it's really it's, sad it's 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 sad to see I think uh, that political correctness is taking over like this uh, even in the army now and uh, I mean it's, it's similar in Sweden too it's uh, it's not too much difference there either well, and for a body politic, the military can serve as a point of pride and dignity. Uh, but how can you take pride and dignity, uh, you know, in your army when the, these are the standards? You know, you drag a few things here and there, and maybe, maybe they need to institute like napping standards. Like if you could take a two-hour nap, then you're going to be in the armed forces. You know, it's it's just getting really silly, and it's demoralizing for the British people. Yeah, it's. Uh, I think we, I think you can say that the the enemy they won't uh, stop and take a break for you if you if you need a break. <laughs> they, they they're not gonna they're not gonna be that kind. So it's uh, you you have to you have to be the best, not uh, lower your standards like they're doing here. In in my humble opinion. Um, I think moving on. Uh, do you want to do your American segment? You have some interesting stuff to talk about in America. By the way, just quickly before that. By the way, I just found the image I was looking for here. If you don't mind, uh, from the Swedish army, they actually had a recruitment flyer here other, uh, a couple of, a month ago. This is a Swedish army recruitment flyer. <laughs> oh my God. Uh, I, 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 I'm, not, I'm not. I don't know. I don't, I'm, I'm just going to say that um, if you don't always march, I mean, you, you have to march in a straight line. You have to have this discipline. I mean, uh, I don't know. If you march like all over the place, if you're unorganized, that is not going to be very good in, <laughs> in, in the fight. They look like idiots. They just look so stupid. <laughs> <laughs> oh, sorry. <laughs> That's just, it's just too funny. Like a, clown, like a clown spit in their faces or something like this. <laughs> Terrible. <laughs> oh, the, com the chat is going clown army, rainbow army. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> oh, it's just too funny. Um, yeah, on that note, do you want to go to your American segment? Uh, I think you have quite interesting stuff to talk about uh, regarding Kavanaugh and different stuff happening in America. I'm not too familiar with all of this, so... I'll let you lead, lead here this segment. So, if I had been, if I had some fancy equipment here now, I would have some fancy transition here. I don't have that yet, but uh, I'm working on it. If this show becomes a success, we'll be getting more fancy graphics. So, anyway, I'll uh, I'll let you I'll let you do this <laughs> do this uh, segment here now. Very good, Peter. Well, uh, it's I think important to just start from the ground up. We have a situation uh, in the United States where it is justice. Robert Kennedy, I believe that was his, that was his name. I didn't I didn't keep track of the Supreme Supreme Court too much before Trump, so I'm not familiar with everyone. I think if you if you put a gun in my head and you said, "What are the names of the Supreme Court justices?" I think I could tell you. Uh, but we had a sort of conservative, Rhino Republican, Libertarian -y justice on the the Supreme Court. Uh, we have, I believe, nine justices on the Supreme Court, and he retired. He retired, I believe, in May. And so there has been a frenzy ever since then because Supreme Court justices are elected for life. They are on that court until they die, they retire, or in some cases, you can uh, impeach them. You can get them removed, but it requires an act of Congress and stuff like this. So... You know, this is one of the most important positions that can be held. I would say one of the top nine or ten positions that can be held in the country besides president, you know. Uh, and so the Democrats have been fighting the Republicans. And we're really talking only about the nationalistic side of the Republican Party because, as you all know, 
uh, you know, Republicans in name only, rhinos, really are filling up Congress at this point. Uh, they really flourished under the Bush administration, and then they also scored a lot of media brownie points under the Obama administration. So we have had a tense, tense battle for mm, two, three months now in this country, and it's really started to culminate. Uh, you know, it hit a new level when Trump declared his nominee, which was just he wants Justice Kavanaugh, who has served. He's federal. He's been a federal judge and stuff like this. He has a flawless record. I mean, you know, near top of his class at a couple Ivy League schools, uh, has a long, respectable history, um, you know, very distinguished, top guy, top notch guy. Trump chooses him. Well, and the Democrats go crazy. I mean, the Democrats would have gone crazy if Trump had named Sammy Sosa, the baseball player, or Michael Jordan, the basketball player. I mean, they just would have gone nuts no matter who Trump chose, but he chose a real Boy Scout, a real Eagle Scout in Brett Kavanaugh. And now we have a situation where a lady in California who apparently went to school or was around Brett Kavanaugh, because Brett Kavanaugh went to a prestigious elite all-boys high school, um, but she was around him at the time. She went to an all-girls school, and they were at a party, apparently. This is her story. Uh, and they were at a party. He was 17. She was 15. And the, the way it plays out is so crazy, Peter. It's so crazy. She says that she was tackled. She was upstairs. There were six people at this party. So three people were downstairs. She was upstairs and she had just gone to the, she was going to the bathroom or something like this. And she got speared. She got tackled into a room uh, and then thrown on a bed. And then someone covered her mouth. And then uh, this other fellow, I, I forget his name, but um, he's he's dis he's disavowed this whole story. But this other fellow that she named, besides Brett Kavanaugh, was there. And as he came over to pin her down, oh, something nefarious was going to happen to her, something real bad, you know, like a rape or something like this. She was able to wriggle free. And they tumbled off the bed, the three of them, and then she was able to unlock the door and get herself out of that room my gosh and then that's the end of the story i mean there's no there's the other people that were at this party it doesn't seem like they know anything about what happened the one guy besides brett kavanaugh is uh, just vociferously denying the story brett kavanaugh himself is denying the story He's saying it's it's nuts it's it's beyond belief uh so we have this lady now let's dig into her let's dig into her background she's a liberal academic Okay, so she studied psychology. She is a registered Democrat. She's a Democratic donor. She marched in Democratic rallies. You know, she's claiming she got groped at a party attended by four other people. All four of those people apparently are denying the claim. And the only hard evidence she has, this counselor lady, this doctorate in psychology, uh, she's working at a, at a university in Southern California, you know, really uh, a sort of troubled person, it would seem, that has a lot of uh, social cachet because of her academic achievements. Her only other evidence she has is that she was in couples counseling with her husband in 2012 and she names the event, but she doesn't name Kavanaugh. So this was a lady who in July um, wrote a letter, I believe, um, to Dianne Feinstein or someone like this uh, denouncing the Trump administration, and then as soon as Trump names Kavanaugh, boom, she's got another letter coming. So she's an activist type. Uh, so this whole story is just really strange. I mean, she was silent for 36 years uh, while, you know, Kavanaugh was, he was getting on in with the Bush administration. He was, a white, I think he was a White House secretary. He was at least a, a federal judge. I mean, his legal career was really taking off, especially under Bush. And she's silent this whole time. She didn't tell any of anybody about the incident for 30 years. I mean, it wasn't until 2012 that she said something. Uh, so this is a high intelligence person, obviously, but she's obviously very troubled as well. And she's saying that she can't, I mean, she's, she has, uh, she's been asked to testify. Hey, lady, come testify. Tell us your story. You know, we're about to, uh, not, we're about to get this guy on the Supreme Court. Come tell us your story. And she goes, well, I have travel concerns. I have claustrophobia. 
she's saying she is so traumatized from this stuff that she has claustrophobia. I mean, Ann Coulter was making the joke that, what are we, is the whole country gonna wait while this lady drives across the country? I, I mean, uh, investigators have offered to send people to you know her offices to interview her there. But no, no, she's got to come to Washington, D.C. Well, are we going to wait? I mean, can she not get on an airplane? Can she not come right away? Uh, so we were set. Chuck Grassley is the Chuck Grassley is the guy that is sort of in charge of this from the Republican end. He is a senator out of the great state of Iowa. Uh, he was going to have everybody. We were going to do the vote on Monday, tomorrow. We're all going to do the vote. OK, we're going to vote. We're going to see who this guy is. Uh, you know, let's see oh, if he's going to get on the Supreme Supreme Court or not. Well, because this lady came out with this accusation, we now have to wait till Thursday of this business week uh, before she even gives her story. So the Democrats are really learning right now. They're sort of testing and they're testing and they're seeing how much they can get away with. And quite frankly, Peter, they're getting away with they're getting away with a lot. Let's just say that. I mean, there's different words I could use for it, but they're getting away with a lot. So that is the main political situation that's playing out right now in the United States. Uh, the Supreme Court just matters so much because uh, it determines the decisions that are made at the highest legal levels in the United States, which sets legal precedents, uh, which you know dictates the flow of the culture and stuff like this. And of course, the Democrats, I mean, this is the the whole thing is why, why they're fighting this so much is because if Kavanaugh gets in, then we have a constitutionalist sort of conservatarian, um, you know, Republican sort of majority in the Supreme Court, which means we can start to overturn things um, like Roe v. Wade and stuff like this. And the Democrats want their abortions. They really want to keep abortions. They want to keep um, slaughtering the innocent uh, they're just evil at this point. And so the whole reason why they're trying to destroy this man's life, uh, not to mention he has daughters, he has a wife, he's a coach of a, a, a young girl's basketball team. They're trying to destroy his life so they can keep killing children. And that's really what it boils down to. It's really sick. Um, and it's hard to believe that this is playing out this way. Uh, you know, it's almost as if any woman can just say anything about a man now. You know, oh you, oh, you kissed me the wrong way 40 years ago. Well, now I've got to destroy your career and destroy your entire life. This that's seems that's to be the moral standard of the left. And this is playing out at the highest levels. It's like political theater right now. It's just absolutely bonkers. That's the kind of thing that, uh, that I'm taking away from this, is that uh, the Democrats are trying to test the ground to see if they can try and stop people from getting appointed in positions just by accusing them of just something before it was used to be before they call they used to call someone a Nazi or racist or whatever that didn't work so now they say oh they're calling a rapist now instead they did it with Roy Moore I believe uh, the guy in Alabama and now they're doing this with Kavanaugh as well they just make something up oh he's a rapist whatever and with no evidence and they just try and derail conservatives that way that, that's the kind of takeaway that I'm getting and I saw Laura Loomer actually. I did a good report on uh, Keith Ellison, the Democrat guy. Uh, he's actually been accused of sexual assault now as well, or abuse. And the media is totally silent. But Kavanaugh, with uh, no evidence at all, just, just, wow, just talking about it nonstop, trying to get him to stop. That, that's kind of the feeling I get from this. And, and you mentioned uh, the abortion thing. Actually, I, I saw that the George Soros has been trying to stop Kavanaugh as well. Do you have anything on that? Yeah, uh, George Soros uh, has been donating to uh, Demand Justice, I believe, or he, he sort of created this uh, dummy, I mean, there's a bunch of dummies if you go and you read their website. I mean, they're sort of angry that white males are having some sort of prominence in society. I mean, this is, again, the ugly leftist identity politics uh, coming to bear. You go to their site, Demand Justice, so, oh, well, hey. Angry white men are taking over society. We have to stop this. If Donald Trump is a is a terrible racist and all this stuff, he's basically poured. George Soros has poured in five million dollars. He's poured in um, six figure donations to this shell of an activist group uh, over the last five years, I believe, and it's it's amounted to like five million dollars. Or he's he's renewed his push and he's put another five million dollars in, something like this. Um, but these people, their entire existence now 
is based on disrupting the Kavanaugh hearings, disrupting the process, trying to extend it out as far as possible because they have a good they have a good idea that the Democrats may take the House uh, this November. They may win back the House. And so if they can just stall this thing out and they have a five million dollar war chest to be able to do this, then they will have success on their terms. And then they'll be able to try and impeach Trump uh, once they have. I mean, they'll do it right away when the Democrats have when they have some measure of of power. You know, if they have the if they have the House or if they have the Senate, they will go right away and they will impeach Trump. So these people are headhunters and they are being backed by George Soros. Um, he is funding this company through um, one of his open society uh, variations. He has like two or three different sort of things that are called corporations that are called open society. And he is funneling the money through there. And it's important to remember where George Soros got all his money. He got all his money from um, taking advantage of uh, some discrepancies in the, the pound in the early 90s. And um, that resulted in the British uh, pound just dropping in value and a bunch of pensioners there losing all their money. So he has used quantum fund uh, to amass a super billionaire capacity as a as a fundraiser now for democratic and communist um you know pursuits so he's pouring money into this demand justice uh situation and these people are crazy you go to their facebook profile and they're just like yes brett kavanaugh is a rapist and we have to we have to get this guy angry man we have to destroy his life and this this uh facebook page has like twenty two thousand likes I mean, it's just unbelievable the money these Democrats are getting in order to do what they do. I mean, I am sure that this this Christine Blasey Ford lady that is lodging these accusations against Kavanaugh, I'm sure there's some money in there for her. I mean, I, I hate to be a kind of cynical person, um, but I really don't want to think the best of her uh, based on all the money and based on her character and her background. Uh, it's just too lucrative an environment now uh, to just sort of like oppose Republicans on principle. The arguments are lost. Now it's just straight criminality. So five million, five million dollars, George Soros. That's what he's doing. Yeah, it's uh, it's, it's not the first time that he's been meddling in politics. I mean, he's been doing that in Europe a lot now. He's trying to overturn Brexit, uh, spending lots of money there. He spent millions to try to get in these NGO West ships, uh, trying to get migrants to Europe and and so on. It's it's crazy. And now he's and he's working to try and destroy Hungary as well. You know, Hungary has a quite nationalist government. He's been working to try and stop them. Uh, it's actually, I think, one of the latest as well. Um, they are having a referendum in Romania about uh, defining marriage uh, as between a man and a woman. They're going to have a referendum on it. But uh, George Soros' uh, sponsored organization is uh, trying to sue them or trying to stop the referendum for some for some reason. They they don't like it. So it's quite insane the election meddling that George Soros is doing, and that the media is uh, well. Funny how they never talk about it. <laughs> you would think that maybe they talk about Russia all the time. But they never mentioned Soros. That's uh, mm, something to think about. Um, I think, do you mind if we move on to uh, some, uh, I have some other stories here from Europe as well. Do you mind if we go back to some European <laughs> European segment here? Are you finished or do you have anything more to oh, say yeah. on the American stuff? Let's circle back around to Europe, yeah. Excellent. All right, we have some stuff from Norway. Actually, I only have two, uh, three more stories to go. Uh, before I am out of story <laughs> that I plan to talk about. So they're quite good, interesting stories. Um, Norway, uh, so a new report done by the Norwegian state media, NRK, uh, has found that 47% uh, of all children involved in child abuse cases uh, are amongst migrant families. Uh, and this is according to Norwegian state media, uh, some mainstream media, uh, with Pakistan and Afghanistan the most common uh, countries for families to be from. A researcher in violence at the police school here in Norway claims it has to do with the honor culture uh, that comes from, that they have in some of these countries. And uh, the populist party here in Norway, uh, the, they actually call themselves the progressive party, but they're kind of the right-wing party, the most right-wing party that they have at least. Um, they want to take measures like obligatory health controls of the children, uh, but the other parts are against it because they want to protect the parents, according to the Populist Party representative. 
Um, I mean, I don't know. So 47% of all children involved in child abuse cases are among migrant families. Now consider that there aren't so many migrants in Norway. It's only about oh, around, what is it, 10% if I remember correctly, around 10% migrants around that area. But 47% come from that small 10% uh, figure. Um, that, that, that's a really interesting thing to look at and uh, something that you have to take into account when you do these mass migration policies that, that that has been happening in Europe a lot, you get this kind of new new things happening that wasn't so common before. And it's important also to remember reporting. I mean, how many of these migrant families are reporting the problems? I mean, you have a, a native population, um, you know, long-standing Europeans, they're probably quite conscientious, or at least their neighborhoods and their communities are. And so they're, if anything, likely to over-report. I, I kind of hate to say it that way. But these migrants, I mean, how much of it is under-reporting? How much higher would their portion of it be um, if every instance was reported? And then also, another thing with this, I think that is important to talk about is that not all not all crimes are uh, of equivalent weight i mean i'm sure that the level of punishment that these migrant families are putting these children through is much more barbaric much more worse than the natives and so while the reporting is what it is i think 47 percent you know, if you adjusted it for the heinousness of the crimes and you adjusted it for accurate reporting, I would say it'd be 80, 90 percent. So, you know, I'm not at all surprised that 10 percent of the population is, uh, you know, representing that 47 percent number. But I think it's higher, honestly. There's probably a, 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 um, a figure there that's, that's not reported as, as the same as with a lot of other crimes. There's a lot of things happening that are not reported at all. So I think you are right. And uh, the next story is also from Norway as well. This is quite a disturbing story, uh, quite a telling story. Uh, Norwegian media, uh, it was actually, I actually read it in the newspaper here the other day. I, I currently live in Norway myself now, so, but I found the article online as well, I have it online. Um, Norwegian media has exposed that older Norwegian women, middle-aged women, uh, are sexually abusing asylum seekers. So middle-aged women are volunteering at uh, asylum centers. Um, you know, they are working as volunteers at asylum centers where young asylum seekers are coming. They are usually around the 20s, 21, 22 years old, often these asylum seekers. Um, and they pressure the young asylum seekers to have uh, sex with them as a repayment for helping these, uh, these, these people. Uh, and the women are called uh, sugar mummies uh, by the asylum seekers. Um, one guy called Josef uh, said to Norwegian media that, uh, quote, she knew I didn't have any choice. Um, and uh, asylum seekers say this is a very common occurrence. Everyone knows someone has gone through this, uh, according to one guy that the no newspaper spoke with. And the women, they buy gifts, phones, they give them money, and they let them, uh, you know, they take them on trips, uh, vacations, and so on. And in return, they, they, they expect, uh, they expect, um, uh, payment for their services, uh, shall we say. <laughs> um, professor in law, John Jacobsen, says that this is a abuse of power by the women. And I mean, of course, he's, he's right. I mean, these women are middle-aged women. Many of them are married, actually. They're married, uh, they're middle-aged, uh, and they go and volunteer at these asylum centers uh, and to get, well, to get, uh, to get, well, to get um, sex from their toy boys, uh, boy toys, I guess. Uh, and this is happening a lot in Sweden as well. I mean, there's been many cases like this. In France as well, it's been reported this uh, migrant workers, uh, these, work, these people that are working with the migrants, that they have been doing these things. It's happening a lot in Sweden. And the strange thing is always middle-aged women that are doing this. I mean, what, what can, what's going on here? Do you have any, uh, do you have any suggestions? I really don't know. It's... It could be, you know, some lonely ladies. Uh, I think they should, uh, they should apply for the UK army and just serve and, you know, have some value to society. So they're, they're obviously physically, you know, capable of it if they're able to wrangle in these young Arab men sexually. I mean, they must have some talents. 
So I, I really have no idea. You know, there's a, there's a common, at least in, in American culture, there's the common trope of the, the empty nester, the woman who her children have gone, they have left. Also, we know that in Europe, the fertility rates are so low. So maybe some of these women never were parents in the first place. And there is a desolation. There's a kind of loneliness uh, that, that middle-aged women face uh, in Europe. And so perhaps that has something to do with it. It's a thrill. It's an excitement. Um, and then women, you know, when they get the vote, they're... I hate to generalize too much, but they tend to vote for larger government and they tend to vote for the maternity state, for the mother state, uh, for getting people taken care of cradle to grave. Now, obviously that changes if a woman is married, uh, it, you know, depending on where a woman comes from, but you know, it's a general trend. So I think some of these women just have fantasies that they're playing out and they're doing it on the, the they're doing it because the government is making it quite easy for them. The government is creating a situation where they're able to exploit these young men. So it's really crazy, Peter. I mean, I, I'd stay the hell away from that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think this uh, crazy cat lady meme is actually based in reality. I mean, uh, it's uh, it seems to be that way. <laughs> you know, they... Uh... Yeah, I think they they grow up. They're lonely. They don't have anything, so they turn to turn to <laughs> turn to this new uh, new exotic uh, meat coming in. <laughs> yeah, totally. <laughs> uh, yeah, I don't, I don't know. So it it seems to be the same among both Norwegian and Swedish women. So, but I don't know. It's probably it's probably a lot less in Norway than Sweden. I would guess the Norwegian people are generally more conservative. But it's it's interesting that it's happening. It seems to be happening in a lot of a lot of European countries, not just Sweden. Um, do you have time for a couple of more stories? Uh, I think we we uh, my goal is to try and keep this. Uh, this is the first time we we're doing this new show. I'm trying to keep it around our mark here. But do you mind if we go on a little bit with a couple of more stories I had lined up? Do sure, you have yeah. time? Yeah. Excellent. Yeah, this, and by the way, if, if you just tuned in, uh, this is a new, this is the premiere of my new live show that I'm aiming to do several times a week. And um, so I'm trying to get things all worked up here. But uh, yeah, we, I'm, I'm going to do this kind of daily news thing where we talk about all the daily news and so on. Uh, so I'll, I'll give you more details later on, on which times and so on. But uh, thank you so much, everyone, for tuning in. And um, Hopefully we can grow this into something big. Um, yeah, I had a, this other story here from the U so the last couple of stories I have here is actually from the UK. Again, <laughs> the UK is featured often it seems in these kind of strange stories. Um, so we have a council in the UK, uh, Croydon, uh, which is south of London, and they uh, they actually paid ten thousand pounds british pounds into a fest sponsoring a sponsoring a festival and uh, and had this so-called artist on stage and uh, he was playing around with uh, sex toys and he was pooping on the stage all paid for by your gracious taxpayers money all your wonderful hard-earned taxpayers money going to a man pooping on the stage um I, I, I don't know what's going on anymore. This world seems to be going crazier and crazier every day. I mean, 20 years ago, you would have been locked up in the insane asylum uh, doing something like this. Now the state is paying for it with your taxpayers' money. Um, do they have anything like this in America? Or is this just Europe? Well, um, we don't in America. We don't have a lot of subsidies of uh, the, well, I don't, I mean, compared to the rest of the world, yes, we have a lot of subsidies to the art, but the arts, but we don't have subsidies to the arts quite to this degree. Uh, you know, and Trump's been trying to cut back on some of that. Uh, but I will say in Canada, they have, uh, if you want to like start a musical act in Canada, they will subsidize you. The government, usually it's the regional governments, will subsidize you to the tune of $10,000, $20,000, sometimes $30,000. Uh, and so Canada has this, this interesting music scene that is, it's, it's very well populated. There's a lot of people doing a lot of things, but it's all very ordinary. It's all very reinforcing the status quo. And so it is almost like a statement about how bad things are in the UK that the government is subsidizing a man who is just 
peeing and pooping on stage. It, it kind of tells you about the spirit of the times right now in the in the UK. Uh, so you know, I would just stay. Away, I would stay the hell away from the UK right now. And you don't want to get any pee any poo on you because. And, and the other thing too, they not they didn't only just raise ten thousand uh, dollars. The corporate the they got tied in with some endowment fund, and they actually added another forty thousand dollars to the pot. So it's actually a fifty thousand dollars subsidy for this festival and, and it's it's just a festival of weirdness so yeah that's the spirit of the times in the uk stay the heck away from those sort of things you know you'll you'll see it um if you're over there they they do all sorts of crazy things now at their festivals um they have police um humping women just openly in the street you know it's a really strange situation but it is a kind of indi indictment of the national psyche so yeah, a lot of crazy stuff going on there. And yeah, I would definitely recommend to stay away from the UK. And if you live in the UK, probably consider moving. Uh, it's not any, any, any good place to stay <laughs> at all. And speaking of which, we have another crazy story from the UK, which is my last story of the day, actually, that I had lined up. Uh, so uh, this one is crazy as well. Uh, a student editor at the University of Durham in the UK uh, retweeted an article on Twitter uh, saying that uh, uh, women don't have penises. Uh, he was fired. He was fired for, for retweeting that article. Uh, the since deleted tweet has received backlash from former... Oh, uh, just hang on. I'll just, I'll just bring it up on screen so you guys can see it. Um, so you guys can see it for yourself. Uh, just one moment. Uh, 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 let me just bring it up. 10 seconds. And there we go. Student editor, editor retweeted article uh, say, saying, stating biological facts, basically. He was fired from his uh, post at, uh, from his journal post at Durham University. Uh, this guy, uh, Anglos Sofoclos, so I have no idea. Uh, he was fired because it was a quote, transphobic tweet. And here's the tweet in, uh, tweet in question uh, by uh, Steve Tweets. I think actually, I actually know, um, I think you might have seen that guy on Twitter. He's posting some interest, some good stuff. Um, yeah, the Sinsley tweet has received backlash from former chair of LGBT humanist Christopher Ward, who claimed the post was factually incorrect and not worthy of a debate. Uh, okay. Um, yeah, I, I, I don't know. Uh, factually incorrect to say that women to state, I don't know. And they're, they're basically, it's, if you state biological facts, you now get fired from your job in the UK. Uh, how, how, did, how can it come to this? I mean, what's, it's absolutely crazy land. It's crazy. And it's, um, you know, it's uh, the, the ocean floor has, I believe it's called detritus or detritus. Uh, it's just the accumulation of uh, whale uh, droppings and, and crustacean bones and you know all this stuff it's just like it's the terrible mush that's at the bottom of course there are animals that feed on that uh, but but what you have in the um in the institutions now is just a lot of garbage you have a lot of garbage people um that have been able to make a living for themselves selling these lies if you base your life off of government handouts and then pushing lies, you're going to end up as a terrible corrupt person um, but if you do it long enough you'll have power and so the, I guess my word of caution for people out there, uh, you know, I've had some struggles uh, doing doing a lot of what I do publicly, you know, as a as a person that is fighting in the culture war for you know philosophical standards and, and, and better treatment of children and stuff like this. I faced a lot of these evil people and a lot of backlash, and my employment has always been decentralized. It's always, it's, it's based a lot of in cryptocurrency, it's based in donations, and it's a very, it's a very decentralized model. And a fellow like this is probably, is probably a reasonably smart person that could bring a lot to bear in his society, he could make it better. But because his employment situation is one where he's plugged in with these people, he's at their mercy. And so it is just worth mentioning to anybody um, that is out there, like decentralize your, income stream. I mean, as much as possible, become resilient. I mean, that's some of that um, black swan stuff and, and some of the anti-fragility stuff by the one fellow who's a philosopher. But you really do want to become resilient because these people will ruin your lives. 
Um, I've had several people try to ruin my life over the last few years since I've been speaking and taking a public stand. And I take it very seriously, and so should any, anybody else. I mean, beyond the madness of just that he stated a biological fact is the real economic reality of the situation. And, you know, if the bad guys win, it's just going to be a lot worse. So that's my word of caution to people or my word of encouragement. Get get expansive, you know, get income from multiple streams um, and, and build up employment with people that you can trust. Uh, this guy was at the mercy of a crazy, I mean, he's got like, they're, they're firing him. And then the crazy LGBT chairperson is like kicking him in, in the butt on the way out. Like it wasn't even worth talking about. I mean, when you look at the guy, I think you've seen his picture. He's a little bit obese. Um, he looks a, a bit overweight. You know, what is he doing uh, in this position? So he didn't have his head on a swivel in terms of how he was making his money. Maybe he just wasn't aware of the realities uh, of the situation. But you do have to protect yourself. You do have to become resilient. Yeah, and the left is uh, going on a campaign, really, to try and uh, de-platform and uh, cut off the economic uh, opportunities for conservatives and right-wingers nowadays. I mean, just look, Alex Jones was actually banned from PayPal the other day. I myself been banned from PayPal. Uh, and, uh, I mean, countless other people, uh, I think Patreon, they banned their rich, uh, what's his name, uh, Robert Spencer uh, from the Jihad Watch organization. And Patreon banned him because Mastercard actually pressed, pre pressured Patreon to ban him. Uh, so Mastercard are getting involved. Uh, I know that people within the right wing movements in Europe has actually been banned by banks. Banks are refusing uh, refusing to ha let them have accounts. Uh, Martin Sellner, for example, of the Generation Entity organization in, in in Austria, he's been banned from twelve banks this year, I think. Uh, so now they're, they're really going after uh, people that disagree with. They don't even let them have money anymore. It's it's actually quite a quite a scary thing, and um, you have to work to, to 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 make sure that they cannot get you financially. So cryptocurrencies is a good thing, as you said, and uh, and uh, make sure you're not dependent on these people. And, and, and also, uh, you know, try to own property. I mean, um, we have enough property rights in the West that. You know, only in South Africa is really the government um, spoiling to take your property from you. So if you can acquire property, even small things or, you know, a small mortgage or something like this, and you can start to get some cash flow, I mean, that's pretty entrepreneurial. And the government can't just steal that from you. Some some civil rights commission or the SPLC, um, it's much harder for them to just steal that from you. So well, they, 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 they could steal the, in the UK if like Jeremy Corbyn comes into power, maybe. <laughs> If the communists come into power, Jeremy, I think the Jeremy Corbyn Labour guys, they actually talked about they want to um, seize certain private uh, things, uh, businesses, and actually the communist party in Sweden, which got like 10%, they, they, want, they actually want to abolish private ownership completely as well. And they got like 10% of the votes in the election. Abolish private ownership. Yeah, that, uh, that, that, but that, that's kind of going into the whole same theme. They want to stop right wingers from making money economically, and the, the even more radical ones, the communists, they want to just completely seize everything altogether. And yeah, um, I think that was that, that was my whole list of news uh, that I had um, that I had lined up for for to, for this uh, show. Is there anything else that you would like to add or bring up, uh, Stephen? No, I'm pretty well satisfied. Congratulations on your new show, and I'm very honored to have been your first guest. And you know, I'm sure this will be a successful endeavor for you. Yeah, it's uh, it's hopefully <laughs> it's a lot of hard work, but hopefully we can uh, grow this into something big. And uh, yeah, before we finish, I just want to say that yeah, this is the this is the new live stream show that I'm doing. I will still be doing my normal videos as well, uh, like separate, just just you know, like normal videos. But I will also be doing these live streams uh, several times a week. I have yet to decide the exact days and the time. The time will be the same, and the time will be at uh, uh, 10 p.m. Uh, UK time, which is 11 p.m. Uh, Swedish time, which is I don't know. It's it's uh, I don't know what the time that is in America, but uh, I guess you'll figure it out. Whatever whatever location you are, but uh, yeah, 10 p.m. Uh, UK time will be the time that uh, this uh, live stream will be will be going. And I'll be doing it several times a week to start with. 
And I don't know the exact days yet, but I will post that uh, on my social media. Uh, so make sure to stay to follow me on social media to to, to get all the information that you need there to follow this 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 show. And um, also make sure to follow Stephen on his uh, on his social media as well. Uh, I'm just going to post a link to his uh, Twitter in the live chat here, so you guys can uh, can. Uh, can follow him. Uh, he's been he's, he's doing very good, uh, very good work, and he has a lot of, of, of good tweets. I recommend, highly recommend that you follow him. Uh, let me just get this link here in the live chat. Uh, there we go. And uh, yeah, I recommend. As I said, everyone go and follow him. Uh, he's a very good guy. And. Um, also make sure to subscribe to this channel as well uh, and turn on notifications, notification bell, uh, so that you don't miss uh, when whenever I do live streams, uh, because YouTube, YouTube has this little bit strange algorithm thing going on nowadays, so you can't really be certain if you get uh, notified whenever I go live. Um, so make sure to hit notification bell and, and smash the like button on this video as well, uh, because that helps give, give this video more views. And um, yeah, as I said, I will, and also on my on my Twitter, uh, exactly which days we'll be doing this, but it will always be the same time, uh, 10 p.m. UK time, that this uh, stream will be going. And uh, and I and I and I believe that we will have uh, you back next week, hopefully, Stephen. Um, yeah, yeah, I'll be back next week. Excellent. Yeah, no, it's uh, we very much look forward to to having you on again. And uh, by the way, I just saw we had a last minute super chat come in, so I'm just going to read that <laughs> read that before we finish. Um, Sean says, uh, beers on me tonight. Uh, thank you so much for the super chat. I assume you like the show, so I'm happy I'm happy for that. Um, I don't drink beer personally, I don't drink alcohol personally, but uh, I don't know, maybe you do, Steven. <laughs> Just a little bit, you know, I gotta, I gotta stay on the straight and narrow, so. <laughs> yeah, I'm completely, I'm completely sober, so. But thank you so much for the super chat, and uh, I hope you all enjoy this, uh, this show, and, um, you can leave a comment afterwards as well, and I'll leave the links as well to Stephen uh, in in the, in the description below after this live stream is finished as well, so uh, so you can find him. I saw some people in the live chat actually asking about uh, where I could find Stephen, so I'll, I'll leave all the all the links as well. So um, yeah, I think we'll wrap that up here. A little bit over time, aiming for an hour, but we are 17 minutes over time. I hope you don't mind. Um, yeah, so I want to. I'll finish off with that, and it, and it, and I'll leave the. I'll leave the last words to you, Stephen. Very good. Well, uh, just uh, stay safe out there and stay sane. And remember to vote for the nationalist side of things that any chance you get. Thank you so much. And um, yeah, we'll wrap it up there. Thank you so much, guys. And we'll see you next time.